Hi everyone, Raghu Marcus, and I'm back with Mind Rolling, and I'm with a very, very old friend that we haven't even talked or seen each other in God knows how long, Robert Svoboda. Robert, welcome. Namaste. Greetings. Greetings. Namaste. We were just talking, actually, offline about our love of the Narmada, and I, I can't help but uh, share that a little bit, Robert, uh, before we go into uh, what I want to get into today about our love of the Narmada River, which uh, it's funny because you just said to me, you know, I've been around the Ganges, the Ganga, for a long time and, and love the Ganga, but there's some heart connection to the Narmada. And I said, God, I have the exact same feeling uh, with the Narmada. And we talked about, uh, so there's a place called Amar Kanta, all of you out there, if you ever get to India one day, it's not easy to make it there. Is it e any easier no. now? I don't think so. Um, it it's not uh, the uh, one one thing that has happened in the state of Madhya Pradesh, which is uh, the Narmada flows through two states, Madhya Pradesh and Gujarat, and the roads in Madhya Pradesh are dramatically improved oh. than when I've been there before. So it still is not exactly easy to get there there's not an airport anywhere nearby or a train station right or, or a train station anywhere nearby but um the roads are far improved so now at least you will not do quite as much of the uh bouncing up and down i mean <laughs> the more rural roads are still crappy but the yeah. main roads in Madhya pradesh are much better so it's it is easier to get there than it used to be i mm. can say that yeah so anybody going to India, I have to say, and I, I'm, I have a feeling Robert would concur, one of the greatest places I have ever been in my life, certainly in India, is Amar Kantak, which is this, where, where not just the, uh, the Narmada, but uh, I forget the name of the other river that falls off the cliff off the, at the top the, of it. The Son. The Son, yeah. S-O-N. Yeah, and uh, there's a, an incredible jungle uh, uh, with a, uh, where the Narmada falls down in a waterfall, and below it, below the town, there is this wonderful deep forest, jungly kind of place where many, many sadhus have, have spent uh, a lot of meditative time in caves or, or whatever. And uh, uh, I think Krishna told me he bumped into one time there, uh, when I wasn't with him, he bumped into a sadhu who had been living in a cave and said, yeah, at certain points, uh, I'm just sitting here, and then suddenly these supernatural beings will pass in front of me. They're like, what do you say, 10, 12 feet tall or something, and uh, I can't move. I, I can see them and have darshan, but I can't move. Yeah, this is what goes on here in the forest. <laughs> well, I can honestly say that doesn't surprise me at all, uh, because they're, they're definitely, I mean, this is true in many pilgrimage places, but definitely there, it's still a place where the connection between the the good neighborhoods of the astral world and and the physical reality, that they're still quite close and and there's there there is still a good a good communication between them. Yeah. Yeah. It's that kind of place. Uh, now, for those of you uh, who don't know uh, Robert uh, uh, and of his work, um, Let's see, we we bumped into your books, which are the Agora books, which is a trilogy. And uh, when did we bump in? The 90s? Did, did, when did they come out, Robert? The first one appeared in 1986. So 86. that's a little more than 30 years ago. Right. And the others followed a couple of years later. Yeah, and it, the first one's called Agora at the Left Hand of God. And... Uh, I got to tell you all out there, I, I, I can't more highly recommend you all reading these books. They are available. You can get them through Amazon. Uh, and uh, they, there is knowledge in there and wisdom in there, aside from great storytelling, aside from being introduced to an incredible being, Vimalananda, who is Robert's guru. And... Uh, uh, it it's some of it may be um a little uh, like if you just I, I actually Robert you know there was a 
a guy that did a TV show recently where he goes around investigating different uh, religious uh, traditions, mystical sects around the world. And he went to India and he went to Benares and he went to the other side of the river uh, where this uh, Agori, quote unquote, Agori was living. And, and, and this guy represented the worst possible aspect of Agoris. I don't know if you, you saw this thing. I just was in horror when I saw it. It was like uh, absolutely had nothing to do with love. Let's just put it that way. It had all yeah. to do with power. Yeah. And, uh, and, but what you get from uh, Robert's books and from Vimalananda is love. And uh, the methodology may at some time seem a little far out. And when he says left hand of God, uh, I'm going to have to have you explain what an agori is just to start this whole conversation. Well, the word gora in Sanskrit means terrible, terrifying, intense, horrific, uh, difficult to deal with in every possible way. And agora means non-terrifying, non-terrible. Uh, Agora is one of the names for Lord Shiva, because Shiva, of course, is the the Lord of transformation, the God of death. But Shiva is has is has transcended beyond the reality of death. And he has been he's the being who is able to provide people the a a good transition between this reality and the next reality. So. Agora is taking things like death that normally as humans we think are extremely uh, undesirable and and finding out the what what we can do with those things that can benefit us and hopefully benefit the rest of the world. And it's of course not limited to death, it's all kinds of all kinds of things that we would not normally think of as as being worthwhile and useful and taking those taking those things and experimenting with them and trying to find out how they can benefit us if and and how they can make us into better individuals so at the base it is very much about love the love of the cosmos for all of the beings that are created in the cosmos and the and the love that we beings uh, are able to reflect back to the cosmos and uh, it is a very sad thing to say that, um, unfortunately, the the vast majority of people who set out on this path um, get diverted by the power that can be activated as a result of following the path, and they and its power is a very a very enticing thing. <laughs> it's something that first attracts you and then enthralls you. I like that word enthrall because, mm. of course, the original meaning for a thrall was a slave. Mm. So when you become enthralled by something, first you become you become fascinated by it, you become enticed by it, and all too often you become enslaved by it. So. Uh, one of the fundamental lessons that I learned from Vimalananda was that whatever shakti, shakti means power, shakti means energy, whatever shakti you work with in the world, and you have to have shakti if you want to do anything in the world. It's um, unfortunately the case that some people believe that the best way to deal with the world is simply to have no no shakti of any kind, and then you can't get into trouble. But then you also can't do anything. So his his philosophy was always, whatever shakti you're working with, and this could be money shakti or beauty shakti or 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 fame shakti or any kind of shakti, whatever shakti that is, you have to make sure that you are directing it and that it is not directing you. He was very fond of drinking scotch. And when he would drink scotch, he would become all the more alert and his mind would become <clears throat> all the more refined and his thinking process would become all the more sophisticated. 
And often he would tell me, holding up the glass of scotch, you have to make sure that when you are drinking scotch or doing anything else having to do with shakti, because an intoxicant is a kind of shakti, you have to make sure that you are drinking it Mm -hmm. and it is not drinking you. Because once it starts to drink you, and we see this all the time, people who are overwhelmed by fame or overwhelmed by money or overwhelmed by the influence they have gained in some way, they let it go to their heads. And it that almost never has a good ending. Yeah. Yeah, really. You know, uh, enthralled. I like that word. And um, and we went through some of that with Neem Karoli Baba. And in fact, uh, Ramdas has said uh, many times, when I first got there, and he could have said, he didn't say I was enthralled, but I was captivated uh-huh. By the, by the powers, by the siddhis, the spiritual powers that he had, and then I realized that was just a like a the barker at a carnival, you know, drawing me in, and it was exactly. the unconditional love that was really what the, what what every, what it was about, the essence of it, and and I get that when I read about Vimalananda. Just tell me a little, tell us rather. Uh, well, uh, let, I I would yeah, just go like ahead. to comment the word captivated is a very similar word because then you're captive. Yes. And once you're a captive, then you're in, then, then you're in, you're in a cage that's been created by your own conception of whatever it is that you're interacting Mm. with. Yeah. Mm. So, yes, very much so. And in our case, thank God uh, we were with somebody that, uh, was not interested in anything but us becoming free, and there was no personal whatsoever um, uh, uh, desire system or attachment going on. So we were fortunate, very fortunate. Yeah. And and I, I mean, I was not fortunate enough to have darshan of Neem Karoli Baba, but uh, Vimal Anandaji did mention him to me after Babaji's passing and said that. He was one of the few sadhus, Vimalananda said this, that he really respected in India. Mm, really? So, and it's been my, you know, a great blessing for me to to know uh, people like you and, and of course, Krishna Das and, and Sham Das, who have spent time with, with Babaji, because um, uh, if, if you can't um, have darshan of the guru, um, sometimes you can get darshan of the guru through the disciple. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Uh, well, tell us a little, just a, a little anecdotal kind of thing, uh, story perhaps or two about Vimalananda to just give everybody a sense of who this being is. And by the way, you know, as soon as you say, you know, of course he loved his scotch, uh, uh, you know, we got a lot of people probably going, oh, okay, another one, uh, you know. Uh, doing that kind of a thing, uh, which they have done because one of my other um, most favorite teachers uh, is Chogyam Trungpa Rinpoche, who uh, yes. who was very similar in in that way. Uh, but uh, and we're going to talk about tantra a little bit uh, as we get along here. But just yeah, a little anecdote or two perhaps about uh, Vimalananda. Well, I mean, let's start with Scotch. His philosophy was um, that it is useful to um, try one's best to understand uh, traditions, ancient traditions, whether they be Indian or otherwise, and to to actively experiment and try to see how those traditions might be useful in the present day, in the modern world. And one of those traditions that's mentioned in the Veda is that the Vedic rishis used to consume soma. And according to him, the soma that the rishis used to use was something that you and I would never be able to find because it is, it's, it's invisible except to someone who has that kind of sight. The word rishi, in fact, means he or she who can see. So it's a very particular type of penetrating sight into the astral world that is very, very difficult for anyone who has not reached a certain spiritual level to be able to experience. Hmm. 
So what he said was that you and I, as individual human beings, are not going to be able to experience that soma because we're not at that place yet. But it is quite possible that there are substances in the world that substances and actions, but he was speaking about substances, that one can use that will have an effect like soma. And if you read the Vedic hymns, they describe the rishis taking soma and then directly communicating with gods and goddesses. And so he said, everyone needs to be able to, to find out for himself or herself what that substance might be. And for him, um, the, the substance, one of the substances that he mainly used for that purpose was scotch. And so that it allowed, and, uh, and, and that's why I say whenever I, whenever he would consume scotch, he would, his, it, it became obvious that his awareness was becoming much connected to not just this world, but to uh, a much more subtle world as well. And he said that was the reason for taking it, not because one wants to get drunk, and, and I can't say I ever saw him drunk, but for the purpose of being able to very quickly transition between this world and the next world for some specific purpose. Hmm. And um, I mean, many times people would um, ask to sit and drink along with him. And often uh, that would have, I remember uh, one of his best friends and another guy who were, uh, who, who had a tendency to, um, uh, to to drink and who had quite a capacity for alcohol. One day they were sitting with him and he said, look, uh, at the moment I'm doing something, I don't want to be disturbed. Normally I would have you drink with me, but I, I right at the moment I need to focus on something. But they said, ah, oh, don't worry, we'll, we'll just sit quietly. And he said, oh yeah, okay. So he gave each one of them a very small drink I mean, much small, smaller than ordinarily they would even be able to perceive. And both of them became extremely drunk and passed out. <laughs> and he said, uh, I mean, he didn't he didn't say it in so many words, but he kind of looked at me as if to say, OK, now they've been uh, immobilized. So now I can go ahead with what I need to do. <laughs> so it, he, he was very much um, in charge, not only of his awareness, but when he wanted to be in charge of the awareness of people around him, um, uh, uh, which was an ability that he did not ever use for um, any ulterior motive other than to encourage things to move in the right direction. Yeah. Right, which is what I said about uh, Maharaji. Uh, exactly. The same thing. And by the way, I, I mean, just to, this is an obvious thing, and but I have, I just... I feel like I want to say it. We are talking about uh, a highly evolved being, Vimalananda, beyond uh, who can transmute energy. Uh, this is not something like whoever's listening thinking, oh, hey, let's go get a bottle of scotch and uh, get focused. Okay, this is not a reality. And we're talking, this is part of the Agora tradition, and his abilities are beyond anything that you and I can think of. Yes, and in that context, um, you know, I, I knew Vimalananda's guru for 10 years. He had three gurus. I knew the, who, the one that's mentioned in the uh, books is Junior Guru Maharaj, um, and uh, who now has his own website, um, Oh. I don't think he would have been happy with that, but it doesn't matter because he's he left his body in 1993. Um, I think, I haven't looked at it in a few years. I believe it is Jatala Sadhu, J-A-T-A-L-A-S-A-D-H-U dot org. His name was Jatala Sadhu Ram Vishwambar Dasji. And he, for decades, he lived... Um, just outside the temple in the town of Simhachalam in, uh, uh, it, it was Andhra Pradesh. At the, that state has been split, so I don't know what state it's in. But it's right outside the large city of Vishakapatnam. 
and Guru Maharaj um, and Vimalananda had their own opinions about things. I um, uh, met with them on uh, a few occasions, and then I would go and visit Guru Maharaj once a year, usually, occasionally twice for 10 years. And during the time I knew him, uh, he he lived on a diet of a very small amount of milk every day, a very small amount of soda water or cola beverage or something like that. <clears throat> but the only solid food I saw him eat was tobacco. And I don't mean he chewed it up and spit it out. I mean, he would take two uh, giant sized tobacco leaves, dark black tobacco from Guntur, a uh, tobacco growing region of that state, and he would tear them into strips and he would just chew on them and swallow them. Oh, and <clears throat> he was the kind of guy that you didn't need to bother opening your mouth about as soon as you started to think he would pay attention to what you were thinking. So one day I was thinking, how do they do that? And before I could open my mouth, he said, what is the use of eating? You wear down your teeth. And he had two rows of teeth. The front row were all worn down and the back row were all really good looking and healthy teeth. He said, you wear down your teeth, you wear out your digestive tract. Who knows what kind of disease you pick up from the food. The best thing to do is find something really poisonous and learn how to do it internal alchemy and create everything you need out of that. Uh, and why is that really good? Because if it's really poisonous, it has plenty of shakti in it. And that shakti can keep you alive if you can do the internal alchemy. <laughs> A little if. A little if. He was very much against drinking, except he would allow Vimalananda to do it. Everybody else, he refused to even uh, 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 countenance the possibility that alcohol could be good for them. But in Vimalananda's case, he knew that he could handle it. Unbelievable. That's such but a it's, it's that internal alchemy that you need to have before you can even imagine that you can work with some of these really poisonous things. Yeah, really. Um, there's a great quote uh, about Agori, Agora and, and the practice. Uh, Burn down everything that is getting in the way to your perception of truth. I like that. Burn down everything. That's and it. and that was very much Vimalananda's philosophy. Uh, any kind of attitude, any kind of conception of the way things might be. I mean, the conception might be accurate to some degree, but he was emphasized again and again, everything, any kind of of mental or phys much less physical construct of a human being is imperfect in some way. Mm. And even if you're going to take advantage of it, you need to know what those imperfections are so that those imperfections do not interfere with your per 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 perception of the reality that, that that thing can provide to you. So, and he said that about he, he said, never to, uh, to me, never take anything that I, meaning he, never take anything that I say is the gospel truth. Try everything out. Confirm that it works for you. If it doesn't work for you, put it aside. Maybe it will at some point. Maybe it never will. The things that work for you, use them, take advantage of them, learn what you can from them, and once you have learned what you can, you can respect them, but don't hold on to them and pretend that, you know, kind of like Lord Buddha said, if you have yeah. crossed the river on a boat, leave the boat on the bank. You don't need the boat anymore. Then you proceed ahead. Yeah. Let someone else use the boat. <laughs> yeah. And he also said, don't believe anything I'm saying. Try it for yourself. Do it, it to yourself. yourself. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. Um. So the third book in the trilogy uh, is The Law of Karma. And uh, I tell people, Robert, that when they talk to me or maybe even ask, what, do you, what is your perception of karma uh, conception? I said, you know, 
I'd rather refer you to Robert Svoboda's book, Law of Karma, because it is absolutely uh, of a, the complexity of the subject is uh, is beyond any kind of simple. You know, you pop someone on the head, you're going to get popped back. So watch out. You know, which is most people's conception. And, and in fact, in the book, uh, I read a little bit of the pervasive temptation to oversimplify the law of karma rises from the collision of the irresistible force of humanity's innate need to comprehend cause and effect with the immovable object of karma's extreme reluctance to di- to diverge itself to humans. Very apt. Well, and when I look back at that book... Um, especially the parts of it that I wrote myself rather than what Vimal Ananda said. Um, I'm struck by, in fact, how, in the 30 years since it was written, how much how, uh, the, the degree to which I have gained an even greater perception of of its complexity and, and the difficulty of understanding it, which is um, in the next year or two, uh, second editions of the three books are going to appear. Oh, really? Which is going to give me an opportunity to reflect on on how over this past thirty years I've been able to the to, you know how much I've been able to to integrate and make use of what I've learned and 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 how I've seen what I've been told has played out in in reality and and I think um, trying to take the 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 it, trying even to explain the law of karma continues to be a very difficult thing to do, particularly because, as we see, life is becoming increasingly more complex and increasingly difficult to understand, even on the level that we're trying to understand it, much less the level of how all these karmic billiard balls are are careening around and caroming off one another. Mm, yeah. And and you go on here, I, I also want to quote uh, ca- from the book, karma being so intricate, decent theories of karma are as difficult to objectively prove or disprove as is the theory of quantum mechanics. One practical difficulty with testing either theory is that cause and effect is only rarely linear. This is some everybody out there, please that only rarely linear. One cause sometimes produces one effect, but far, far more commonly, a number of cooperating, concomitant causes are needed to produce a single effect, and a distinct cause quickly spirals into a cascade of interconnected effects. I, uh, that that does get a little bit to the heart of, of really the, the difficulty and the complexity that we're talking about, but uh, perhaps you can and, go, go into it a and, little bit. And this is, I mean, this is just modern physics, really. Um, the, you can, you can, if you have two objects in space, you can, uh, you can, de- and you know how they're moving, you can describe how they are going to interact with one another. But once you get even to three objects in space, being able to predict, even if you know their original positions and their original motions, it becomes extraordinarily complex just with three objects to know how that interaction is going to occur. And when you multiply that by trillions and quadrillions, it's it's far beyond the capacity of the human mind to comprehend. So... Um, it's, I think, um, it, the person who was quoted as having said this was, uh, Gandhiji, and it's quite possible that he said, he did say it, but there is a saying that once God <clears throat> invented the law of karma, he was able to retire <laughs> because, uh, it, it just, things have, have continued to, um, the, the the billiard balls have all continued to interact with one another, and that interaction has taken on such momentum that it is with that momentum that we're 
a part of what's going on. Certain things, no doubt, uh, have a much closer to of a one to one connection. Uh, if you um, make it a habit of uh, smoking um, uh, cigarettes for um, uh, a pack a day for 20 years, it's very likely that your body is going to deteriorate. You're taking in a poison on a regular basis and your body can only take so much of that poison. But even just from the point of view of physiological health and disease cause and effect, um, the Ayurveda, which I was trained in in, in India <clears throat> for many years, Ayurveda describes the, the basic principle of understanding how things work, both health and disease, as yukti. Yukti comes from the same root as yoga. The word yuja, which means the root yuja, which means to join together. And the, the traditional example is when you make a clay pot, you make a pot, the basic reason that you have a pot is because of clay. But just having clay is not going to create a pot. You have to have water to cause the clay to adhere together. You have to have some means of, of forming the, the, the mud into a pot. And then you have to have some kind of heat, whether it's the sun or a kiln or whatever it is, to cause the pot to become fixed in a particular shape. And all this has to be directed by the potter. So it's true that the pot is mainly made out of clay, but the clay is not going to spontaneously assemble itself into a pot. You have to have all these other factors in order to create it. So the, the, <clears throat> the point is very much that anything that's created, any action, any substance, anything in the world, is the result of many different factors that have come together to create it. And we may be able to identify some of the major factors sometimes, but often it's what is the most important factor is something that's very obscure because of the number of factors and all the different ways in which they are interacting with one another. Yeah. Can you... I don't know if you can, I'm sure you can, but uh, give some idea of the uh, how to, the concept of karma in, in, you know, many of our listeners are uh, next generation and, uh, you know, going through the vicissitudes of very difficult times that we live in right now. And any... Uh, uh, some kind of understanding of the laws of karma in a in, in a kind of practical way that can give a little bit of leverage to the way in which we can get sucked into uh, various moments which are divisive and polarizing uh, and so on having maybe a bigger <clears throat> view that 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 uh, can be given well um, I think that <clears throat> one thing that everybody should do is to spend a little bit of time every morning and every evening reviewing one's own personal reality. Vimal and Nanda like to do it in a particular way, and it's a way that I continue to use because it works for me. And when he would get up in the morning, he would say three things to himself. He would say, first of all, I am definitely going to die. I am alive, and the one thing I can be sure about is I'm going to die. It may happen today and may not happen today, but I need to be prepared for it happening today because it could happen this very day. So, and... The very fact that I am alive is something I should be thankful for. I'm thankful to Providence. I'm thankful to uh, all the beings that are giving up their lives so that I can eat them and stay alive. I'm thankful to my family, to all the people who helped me out. That He said, 
please be thankful, be, be grateful for life, because this gives you, if you don't have any life, you don't have the opportunity of, of experiencing what you need to experience, according to your karmas, because we're born because of previous karmas that have brought us to a particular place and time so that we can work out some of those uh, karmas that we have already performed in this in the context of per performing yet further karmas. So at least we should be thankful for who for being alive, aware of the fact that we're going to die. And he he would say the third thing is he would pray that he would not cheat his own conscience, mm. that he would always pay attention to his conscience and let his conscience be his guide. And often that the voice of that conscience is very, very small. And the voice of all the things that you're attracted by can be very, very loud. So those three things he would say in the morning and at night before he went to bed, he would ask himself three things. Have I lived? Have I, have I really <clears throat> made, taken advantage of this, of my life during this day and not killed time. Lots of people are killing time mm. by whatever means. And he said, there's no, it's, it's ridiculous to talk about killing time. It's time who are, who, that's killing us. Mm. So rather than killing time, we should be aware of the fact that we have 1,440 minutes in the day. And each of those minutes can be used in a positive way or in a negative way or simply wasted. So how much of those min how many of those minutes did I positively use during the day? Have I lived? Have I loved? Have I taken a, a, the advantage of the fact that God is love and every time that I experience real love, not selfish love, but love that is the the love that the the supreme reality feels for the cosmos itself, have I allowed that to flow through me and feel that and for other people to feel that in me? And have I laughed? Have I laughed at my own stupidity and all my own foibles? And he said that if if I can answer yes to those three questions, then it's been a successful day. <laughs> and if I have to answer no, then then I need to commit myself to doing a better job the next day. Mm. So inevitably, karmas being what they are, each karma that we experience is going to try to push us in a particular direction. So if we just take a little bit of time every day to try to keep ourselves as alert and awake as possible and to reflect on what we've done and to try to improve our way of being awake and alert in the context of what sometimes are very complicated situations that don't have any resolution sometimes for years on end, then at least we can keep moving forward. And otherwise, Vimalananda said, you know, the fundamental basis of the law of karma are two things. One is Newton's third law of motion. Every action is going to produce some kind of reaction. And number two, um, the golden rule. Whatever you do to someone else should be something that you want to have done to you because at some point, in some way, it's going to be done to you. Maybe not in the way that you think, maybe not at the time that you expect, but it's going to be done to you in some way. I also like the way uh, there's a Hindi proverb that I think says it pretty well. It's attributed to Goraknath. Many things were attributed to Goraknath, and if he didn't say it, then uh, he easily could have said it. It sounds better in Hindi, so I'll say that first, and then in English. Bina mange sumile dud, mange sumile pani, kenche se liye khun ye gorak bani. If you don't ask from the universe, the universe will give you milk. Just as when you're born, you don't know what's going on, but nature is providing milk to your mother so you can suck on the tit and be nourished. You, you don't even know what to ask for, but you're relying on the on providence to feed you and nurture you. And providence takes care of that and provides you milk. If you ask for something, then you get water because that's that's an exchange. 
That's a, an equitable exchange. You ask the universe for nu nutrition, and the universe says, uh, everybody gets water, so I'm going to provide you water. Anything else, you're going to have to work for. And if you grab for something, you will end up with blood. And khun ka badla khun. If you, uh, payment for blood is in blood. Mm. Uh, because blood is the life of somebody else. And if you're grabbing, you're taking the life away from someone else. Whatever way you grab, it's not necessarily just in the context of killing an animal and eat it. But it's it's it, if you're taking away the vitality of someone, then you're going to have to have your own vitality taken away in some way at some time. We don't know when or how. So this is a fundamental uh, this. I mean, this is a as is the case with any kind of very basic principle, it's a very basic principle. But as a basic principle, the more you can rely on the universe and not be worried what's going to happen, you will find the universe giving you what you need. Um, Guru, Guru Mick Jagger was, <laughs> ha, has told us very clearly that even though you can't always get what you want, you will often find <laughs> if you try, that you will get what you need. Mm. And that's what that's what the universe is telling us. <laughs> if you ask for something, you will very likely get it, though you may have to pay a price for asking for it. If you grab it, if you take it from someone, then you can be pretty sure that you're performing a karma, that you are going to have to pay back because you're taking it away. Mm. Mm. Wonderful. Wonderful, Robert. I think that um, I mentioned earlier uh, in our chat, we have to at some point uh, get at the uh, concept of Tantra. Um, and in, in the introduction to the Law of Karma, among the beliefs that Vimalananda shared with Orthodox Tantrics are Orthodox Tantrics, kind of, Yes. Orthodox Jews, I don't know. Yeah, uh, <laughs> you, we, yeah, exactly. We don't know how to describe that. Yeah, they know, they think they know who they are, but then they may. Yeah, but right. we who don't knows? necessarily know. Right, the one reality creates, underlies, and weaves together the multiplicity of matter, and the word tantra derives from a root meaning to weave. Uh, that the oneness of reality is clearly perceived only when all the many varieties of personal obstructions have been removed. And three, that these obstructions can be removed by manipulating the matter of which they are formed for, uh, is that there is no substitute. This is the, the big one here that a lot of people think about. Uh, there is no, we get this question all the time because of Maharaji, there is no substitute for a personal guru who shows you your path by giving you a spark of living knowledge. There is no Tantra without a guru. Um, yeah, talk about Tantra a little bit, because this is really at the heart of, of, uh, of, the, of Vimalananda's path, I believe. Well, there are several different definitions of Tantra and Vimalananda would use a different definition depending on who he was talking to and what kind of mood he was in. But um, I think let's take weaving at the moment. Suppose you wanted to learn to weave. It's very possible that if you sat long enough and you happened to find a loom, um, that maybe you would, at the end of several years of experimentation, be able to come out with a piece of cloth. Um, but if you really want to become a weaver, you don't want to try to reinvent the wheel. You want to go to someone who is a master weaver, like Kabir was, for example, because that person has already gone through the grind, has already, has already embodied the art of weaving in his or her body and can uh, can directly assist you to become um, introduced to that the because, because it's the fact that weaving has been part of human reality for 
who knows how many thousands of years, but many thousands of years. As a result of which, there is a certain momentum in the astral world that we could call, for want of a better word, the weaving momentum. It's And it's a kind of a reality. It's a particular kind of shakti that involves the aware. It's like music. It's like any other kind of art. It's when many people have worked with a particular aspect of reality over many generations, that aspect of reality takes on a little bit of its own personality. And it can, in, and we can interact with it. Vimala, one way that Vimalananda would describe Tantra was as the science of personality. Hmm. So let's say that we were working with weaving. It could also be alchemy. It could be j Jyotisha, astrology. It could be anything. <laughs> but there is a reality of weaving in the astral or the archetypal world that's been created by human beings. And if we tap into that, then in fact, it would not be you or me trying to weave, it would be that force of weaving that is the, that is the, uh, the, the sum total of all the weaving that's been done by all the humans. It would be that momentum and force of weaving that will be acting through us in order to create the finished product. And that's why the guru is necessary, because it is the guru, or in the case of weaving, your, your weaving teacher, who introduces to yourself to you how exactly to align with that reality. And if you watch them working, you can, and you have a certain subtlety of, of awareness, if you watch them working, you can see that reality working through them. And once you can see that reality, then, then you have a way of connecting to that reality and and, and and opening yourself to it so that it can work through you. So, and weaving is a good um, example for Tantra, not only because that's where the word comes from, uh, because a, a, another word that derives from the same root is the word tanu, which means the body. So the human body is woven from many different things. It's woven from our karmas, it's woven from the DNA that um, the genetics and epigenetics that um, are part of um, our uh, the what we gain from our ancestors. It's woven from the awarenesses of our ancestors all brought together that is connected to that D uh, DNA and those epigenetic informations. Um, and. It, so it's the we have the inheritance of the karma that we have performed, the inheritance of our ancestors, the inheritance of <clears throat> the genetic material and the epigenetics, the inheritance we get from the culture and all the previous humans that have worked with that culture that we're part of and the language we're part of. All of these things are being woven together into what any individual happens to be. So what Tantra is saying is you can actively choose to guide the weaving of yourself with the help of the benevolent forces in the universe that are trying to encourage humans to move in the right direction. And the process by you, how you do that is called Tantra. And they're Tantra is not a religion. I think it's important to say that there are Buddhist tantras, Jain tantras, Hindu tantras. There could just as easily be tantras in any other religion because it is a process. It's not a religion. It's it's a it's a method, and the different methods that have been described uh, in different traditions suggest that if you employ this method you can expect to get a particular kind of result. So it should be, you should decide very clearly what kind of result you want and then find a method that it has at least the potential to move you in that direction and mm. provide you with that result. Mm. Yeah. Um, interesting side point here, not uh, because when you talk about choosing a method or choosing a way 
in, in terms of weaving, um, it brings up the whole um, conundrum, shall we say, of fate and karma, free will and fate. And that's a confusing point for, for many. Um, and in fact, uh, we, you know, we've d- discussed this, uh, Ramdas, Krishnadas, and I and others at, at uh, these retreats we do in Maui. Um, and uh, the, the story that or the originates from our time in India with Maharaji is that uh, Ramdas once uh, said to Maharaji, uh, our karma and grace the same. And he said, I'm not talking about this with you or in public or something like that. I'm not talking about this. And then Ramdas was like confused. He's like, geez, I mean, how could they? In, in his mind, they, they must be the same. Uh, and, uh, and later, uh, a, f- a number of hours later, Maharaji sent uh, a close devotee to Ramdas and said, Ramdas, Maharaji wants you to know that uh, he under that Ram you understand him very well, something like that. And over the years, this has always been a you know a bit of as I said a bit of a conundrum about that. I mean, so many people you know around effort and free will and grace and you know all of these subjects, especially in bhakti yoga, our tradition. And one day I asked Siddhi Ma, I think you, you may know who she yeah. She was, you know, saint yes. in her own right who's still alive. Uh-huh. I said, Ma, what is the deal here? And I told her this story. And she said to me that uh, it is not, uh, yes, it is the same, but it is not understandable. It is not possible to understand this from duality, human duality point of view. Not possible. But that is an ultimate truth. She didn't say it in exactly these words. Uh, right. But that uh, one should, um, on a day-to-day basis, act as if there's an effort and uh, karma to be made. And so when we we talked about it, it, it seemed like that's what Maharaji was saying. And I, just from your point of view, Vimalanda's, Vimalananda's point of view, a little... You know, I, addressing I think, this. I think that on those moments when he was willing to address this question, he would say something similar. Hmm. And the way that I personally understood it is that um, there, there is nothing. There, there is not something. There is no action. There is no particular action that a human being can do to 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 open oneself to grace but that grace is is always there and and when things align properly that is the moment that the grace will descend and what one can do is to always try to be open and quietly attentive and watchful and ready for that to occur. That if one is going to perform any kind of karma that could assist the process, it would be uh, watchful waiting and attentiveness. And so that when that moment does occur, one can take full advantage of it. Mm -hmm. But he was very specific about the fact that there's, there's no way as a human being to really comprehend the process and there is no way to advance the process and certainly not by being ambitious about it and yeah. thinking that you're going to get to nirvana at top speed if you work a lot harder and yeah. stay awake all night and or whatever it might be. Right. There might be times you need to do that in, in your particular case. You need to do what you need to do to align yourself best with the universe and to surrender your willpower as far as you can do, which is, I can testify, is not an easy thing to do, but you have to keep trying to do it. And at the right moment, that's when that will occur. We mm-hmm. don't know when the right moment will be. So we have to be watchfully alert all the time. Yeah, for us, 
uh, your watchful alertness can be translated for us as chanting the name, which is, uh, you know, that that's a main practice of ours. And uh, that's that's what Vimal Ananda said. He said, I've taken all the possible intoxicants. And as he described them, he took some very unusual ones. But he said the best intoxicant I have ever found in the entire world is the sweet name of God. Mm. And chanting the name is the best possible thing in this Kali Yuga to do. And mm. that is the one thing if you were going to do perform any one karma during any one day, you should chant the name of God. Mm. Mm. Om Namah Shivaya. Yeah. Ram, Ram, Ram. Ram, Ram. Um, one day, Maharaji was walking with a very close devotee. Krishnas may have mentioned his name to you, Casey Tuari, who is like a father yes. to him in oh, India. Yes. And, 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 yes. Yeah, very close to us. In fact, we're, doing, we're putting together a documentary about him right now. Oh, uh, excellent. It's going to be really amazing. Um, and he said, <laughs> he said to Maharaji, you know, this doing these prayers, repeating the name all the time, it's it's all bullshit. Nothing, you know, there's no, nothing about our will is going to get anything happening here. I mean, what what's... Re- and Maharaji said, you're absolutely right. <laughs> it is bullshit until that... But you keep doing it because that one time that you yes. repeat it in truth is, you know... That will be that one time. That will be that one time, yeah. That will yeah, be so. that one time. Um, that will be what's required. What we're... You know, I'm I'm keeping you for uh, you know a long time here because I tell you I have, I just I didn't even get that far. I mean, I I read the books Robert some time ago, and I I brought them back out, and I went through them because of our podcast, and I have notes here. I could keep you here easily three, four, five hours going through. I I mean, we may have to inveigle you to uh, to come back, but uh, there's just one thing that I I just loved here, uh, Sankhya. No. Th- and you'll explain Sankhya, which I know uh, from the Buddhist tradition, uh, right. the Sankhya tradition, sees the universe as a continuous evolution from a Big Bang event during which a sense of separateness develops within a portion of the singularity that is the one reality in, man- in unmanifested form. That portion of the one which sees itself as separate is known as prakriti, nature, and the remainder, which remembers that all is one, is referred to as purusha. The law of karma comes into effect at the instant prakriti separates from purusha, the first act from which all other acts develop. It is an act motivated, it is said, by a spontaneously arising desire within purusha, to produce individuals who might perceive and know it. Uh, well, um, I, I can amplify that a bit by the probably the most beloved saint in Maharashtra. Maharashtra is where Mumbai is and Pune is. The most beloved saint in Maharashtra is probably Jnaneshwar Maharaj. And he wrote a commentary on the Bhagavad Gita that is read regularly by tens of millions of people. And he wrote another book called the Amritanubhava, which means simultaneously the nectar of experience and the experience of nectar. And in this book, he said, the reason that the supreme reality created the universe is that just like a human can only see his face or her face if they look into a mirror, there was no way for a homogenous reality that was consciousness limited in no way to perceive itself. And from somewhere, we don't know where, this is part of the great mystery of reality, a desire arose for that consciousness to be able to perceive itself. So the universe and everything that's in it is the mirror for that awareness. And in that mirror, the consciousness perceives itself. And each one of us is a microcosm of that universe. And we act as individualized mirrors so that the supreme reality can see itself. And the more transparent we are and the better we are able to reflect the supreme reality, 
the better a mirror we are and the better the supreme reality can experience the fulfillment of that desire. Mm. So um, this is the, the, it's at, certainly at the basis of the Sankhya philosophy, which is the basis of Ayurveda and Tantra and Jyotisha and all the other classical sciences of India, because it's an explanation of, of how matter, you know, the modern Big Bang believes that everything is energy and matter and somehow consciousness arose. It never explains how consciousness could arise from inert matter. The Indian approach is exactly the opposite. There was concentrated consciousness, which interfered with itself to become progressively more inert. Like Buckminster Fuller says, a knot, I mean, yes, a knot, in a string is a self interfering pattern. Hmm. So there, the, when, when the, that desire was enough to create a pattern of desire, the basis of the universe is desire, that desire to experience itself and that reflection and then reflection back has, those were the karmas that eventually caused everything that we see around us, everything that has become dense and solid, and relatively impervious to consciousness, but really at the basis of all of those things is that consciousness, whether we call that consciousness Shiva or Rama or God or whatever we may call it, it's that supreme awareness that is in fact at the basis of everything that's created, from which everything has manifested, into which everything will eventually resolve that consciousness that we should do our best to act as mirrors of. Hmm. Boy, oh boy, we're going to end right on that. Couldn't be better, Robert. Oh my God, we, I, I am, we're, we'll have to get you back here because there's so much more that, that we can go on with. Um, and, uh, and I do want to mention to everybody, Robert also is, uh, uh, has uh, books about Ayurveda and is an accomplished Ayurveda and and also Indian astrology is an expertise of him and there's books on that as well. We're going to have all of it on uh, BeHereNowNetwork.com slash MindRolling. You'll go there and we're going to put it on the show notes page so that you can easily link and, and, and get these books, which... Uh, and, you know, for my money, start with the Agora books because they're just uh, absolutely fantastic and riveting and entertaining in terms of, uh, you know, the writing that Robert does. Uh, so, uh, you know, I can't thank you enough, Robert, for being here and well, catching up. Too. Thank you. So, yes, uh, great to catch up. And, you, yeah, we're going to see Robert again, as I said, uh, in the future and hopefully near future. Uh, so this is a mind rolling and, uh, please, we'll see you come back. Uh, oh, by the way, get out there and subscribe to, uh, mind rolling on iTunes, all of you, and make sure you do that and spread the word and also about be here now network.com and we shall see you next week. <laughs>